Our tests are understandable by non-software people. Let's go a step further. Would a non-software person understand the test? Am or I is... allowed to ask a question? Yes, please, please could ask a question. Is that important to you that non-software people can read the tests? <laughs> Um, yes, kind of yes. What I would like to do is that if I pair with a, a non-software person over a test, that at least after a little introduction, the non-software person can follow what's going on. Not just, here are all the tests, read that, and then you understand how the system works, but more from a collaboration perspective. Okay. So, so we collaborate over the tests. Yeah, we do that a lot, but they don't read the tests. So you I can't understand the test, but together, if you collaborate, we use the tests as to a... know what the system can do. Okay. Okay, cool. Cool. So we're going slowly in the direction of false. Interesting. Our test tests document the behavior of our system. Next question. <clears throat> Valentina, definitely, because he just, she, sorry, she wrote, just wrote a LinkedIn post that I found very good, by the way. Thank you, Valentina, about, <laughs> about TDD versus BDD. And it's all about the behavior, even in the original TDD, by example, book from Kent. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, that was probably the biggest discovery about um, TDD, simply because no one ever mentioned the word TDD, uh, sorry, behavior when mentioning TDD, but only mentioning classes. Mm -hmm. And then the amazing thing is, so both Kent back in like on page one or two mentions behavior and his most recent quote from like a few years back, like couple your tests to behavior and not to structure. Mm -hmm. And that changes the whole thing a lot, I think. Yeah. The tight coupling and everything. Feel free to share your LinkedIn post, then you get more views and more comments and more likes if you want to. Next one, almost last one. Our documentation is out of date. True or false? <clears throat> Yeah, I would expect a lot of truths because documentation it gets very easily out of date. It's kind of the nature. Who is generating documentation completely so you don't, so it doesn't get out of date? I don't see any false, so I don't expect any. Yes. And last one. Business people will collaborate closer with us when doing ATDD or BDD. Do you think yes, or do you think no, this is just a marketing session? Why do you think that is so? Language. Hmm. Because we're speaking the, the business language, domain language, the subject matter expert language, mm -hmm. and we're putting that in our code base. Mm -hmm. Cool. But isn't that part already of domain driven design? It is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, I would say the difference between uh, domain driven design versus like ATDD, domain driven design helps us, okay, identify. Uh, the entities and the business logic, but it's still in, in an abstract way, whereby here we've just, we actually converted into uh, examples. So it's actually more clearer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, domain-driven design is a huge topic here, I agree. And, and I found one of the goals definitely from domain-driven design is to bring the business language into the code base. Entities or values or object is a little detail, I think, but all the rest should be somewhere in the code base. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. All right. We focus on the technical part today. So we are not going to discuss this problem over here. 
but I we can discuss that later on. Um, this is a symptom that I see a lot in the Scrum teams. Here are your 147 features as user stories in a backlog. Please just go get them done. This is a typical problem. Or another typical problem that I see a lot is the lazy fact that you see over here. You were probably too lazy to read that number. People are too lazy to read this number. And I found that quite interesting when I thought about these things with, uh, and I heard it in another session, can you actually specify how Excel works with user stories? As a user, I want to have a cell. If I click that cell, what's going on? That's, I think that's impossible. Excel has grown over time and it takes just that uh, over time and it got all this functionality and features. Another topic that I don't sorry, necessarily... Sorry, sorry yes, please. to interrupt you, Peter, but there are some comments on the meetup page that people are in the waiting room and can't come in. Yeah, I see them. I see them. They had, I'm, I just had them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. And, and Peter, as we're recording, if you're not sharing the, your screen of Miro, we see nothing. Yes. So I should share my screen. Yes, I think it's better. Okay. Okay. Uh, boom. Boom. So here we are. <clears throat> um, we were talking about humans too lazy to read, humans too, too lazy to understand, things like that. And another problem that I see a lot is typically the waterfall driven approach. And this is also a problem with the scrum approach. Typically it looks like that, that we have a development phase and we have a test phase. And the challenge though is that the development phase just takes a little bit longer. So the testing doesn't get enough time to do a proper testing. And now we're doing the same in a sprint. In the two weeks, we have the same challenge. And yeah, that's not nice. So we need to change our ways of working if we want to, to work better. And this is what acceptance testing is proposing, I think. But let's get started. Um, I want to mention something. And usually I have someone from the context-driven testing community in the talk, but I don't see any person at the moment. Who knows the difference between testing and checking? At, at least Urs should be nodding his head. Yes. And I guess the others have heard this distinction as well. Now, testing is everything where you need your human brain to test a system. If you follow the community around Michael Bolton and James Bach, they will they have a huge um, talk about that. And it's quite an important topic, but I on purpose ignore this distinction completely. So I, when I say testing, I don't make the distinction between checking and testing, just so you're aware. Please check out the material from James Bach and Michael Bolton. They have a lot of good stuff on YouTubes, on the internet, um, great guys, great stuff that they have. All right, let's have a look on acceptance testing. Now, if you want to have a little bit of fun with developers that I would have now with you, but I don't do it, is tell them, I split up you guys in breakout rooms and then you have to define what a unit test is. And then we come back and then we look at the definition of a unit test. And the funny thing is, is we will get um, at least 10 different versions of what a unit test potentially is. And that's one of the reasons why Google decided 12 years ago to not distinguish anymore unit tests, integration tests, black and white, and all these other test types. So they say that we just have three test types, small, medium, large. A small test is no network access, no database, no file system, blah, 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 blah. And the large test is basically spinning up the whole thing with a Spinnaker and Kubernetes owned web application and everything in the background, and then they are exercising the whole thing. And they just have this distinction, small, medium, large, and also the timing here. 
I found that quite interesting because it's all about feedback loops. It's all about um, that kind of thing. And we don't care so much about unit tests versus integration tests and whatnot. So here is my proposal. Sorry, not my proposal, but the proposal from scrum.org. Um, as you may know, I work as a trainer for scrum.org. There's a training called APSST um, that I run four times a year. And in that training, we have a different way on how to look at things. And the, the way on how we look at things are actually these three. The first one is developer tests. Now, these are developer tests, are tests that, are, that the developers care about. So they are for the development team. So you are exercising a certain interface and you're expecting something back or you are uh, spinning up a, a technical piece of software, a calculator, a validator, and you're doing something and you're expecting certain things. So these are things that, are, um, that developers care a lot about, but not necessarily just the business, the subject matter experts or people like that. But on the other hand, you have exploratory tests. Exploratory tests basically is this world where we do manual testing. The business tries to find things, ask questions, how do certain things work and whatnot. So we have those two things, developer tests and explorative tests. And in the middle, we have the acceptance tests. Acceptance test is where we collaborate with the product owner and the developers together and we agree on this is how the system should work and then we implement and make them agree. So this is the distinction we only care about in, in from that perspective. Um, do we have yes, time please. for some discussions? Yes, please. Uh, because I don't like this uh, classification here because yep. uh, exploratory testing is okay. That's the things you can't check for, uh, that, uh, the implicit knowledge that you have as a tester. But the other two, development acceptance, are for me, they are uh, almost the same, let's say it this way. Because if, if I write the acceptance test, then yeah, I collaborate with the business, I talk to them, how should the system behave? It's nice, but even if I write a little small test around the, uh, algorithm mm -hmm. um, I do that because it is used for a feature that is delivered to the customer or user mm -hmm. so I should collaborate on how the algorithm should behave with mm -hmm. the business as well so mm -hmm. there should always be uh, the trigger to develop a feature or an algorithm is always triggered from uh, a user's need so we should collaborate to understand the problem the user has or the, the need the user has. Mm -hmm. I really don't see a distinction between development and acceptance test regarding collaboration. I, I agree in a perfect world, there would be always um, a stakeholder within our company that could um, clarify questions around what the behavior should be or what not. But in my experience, especially if you have a, uh, I call it a complicated subsystem team, where you have a team that is specifically working on a technical piece of software, and no other team is is ne no no stakeholder actually what needs to use that piece of software, but just other pieces of software. In that case, a developer test would make sense, I would argue. Uh, Peter, I think that this viewpoint, which was just being discussed about now, it's um, a viewpoint which also Ian Cooper expressed in TDD Revisited, whereby uh, he's saying developer tests, they are acceptance tests, as in well, whatever we write, uh, it should be more, it's just okay, not written in Gherkin, for example, but written in X unit uh, syntax. So he actually <clears throat> basically uh, equates them basically saying that we use acceptance criteria and then based on acceptance criteria that that's how we write those developer tests so then he just uses that one word for him it's it's equivalent mm. and th that's why he actually threw away the usage of gherkin mm. because he's saying yeah. unit tests are uh, the only tests of behavior not testing structure therefore all of those tests are essentially uh, acceptance tests mm -hmm. 
And maybe I can give an example from the current code base I'm working on just, just today. Um, we have in Perl, <laughs> we have a function that is um, reading um, data from an XML file. And in that XML file, we have all the data that is responsible for printing the, 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 the receiver of a letter. So it's first name, last name, post like code, um, stuff like that. And um, certain specific cases when um, the, the certain data is not there and things like that. And reading that data from an XML file and um, spitting it out into a PS file, a PostScript file that is later printed is very technical. And the business really doesn't care about all the inner workings there. The business just cares about if I have this data, I want to see it on this letter in this format. And just this little function that does the XML to something, something mapping would be, uh, at the moment, we basically wrote a couple of developer tests around it just to get safety that it works. But I agree. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to write developer tests? Why is there not a subject matter expert in the company that cares about this piece of software or this piece of code? Maybe it can also be other stakeholders, so not necessarily business. I mean, if, if we're writing it, okay, we have to be writing it due to someone needing it. So the stakeholder could be another, be another development team who's maybe requesting some kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. So it could be that way as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. So we have this distinction. You know, yes. Um, I have this picture. You can't enter my every test. Someone have to be done by humans. Exactly. This is also the reason why we have context-driven community. And the definition of an acceptance test from a high-level high view of, uh, is assert that the system does what the user want. Because the product owner, as I explained before, is, should be a customer representative in the Scrum world and should tell, should know what the user want. Yeah, but that's strange as well, because if I have a developer test, the mm -hmm. developer test checks that the system behaves in the way that the user wants it too. From a technical point of view. Yeah, it's just uh, on a on a smaller scale. It's just mm -hmm. uh, one piece of the whole thing, but it should still behave as the ex uh, as the users want it to be. Mm -hmm. Want it to behave. <clears throat> want it to behave. So uh, maybe I, I see uh, it's more mm -hmm. in the scale of the tests yep. and not in uh, yep. a, a really a hard distinction between the both uh, types and we don't write our acceptance tests in Gherkin, so. We need to. Uh, yeah. But I, I guess as a user, I don't care if my data comes from an XML file, from a config file, from a, I don't know, whatever API. As a user, I just want to get my job done. So the distinction could be somewhere around there. You have a you have a question from uh, from Ferdinand Ade on the so, chat. He say, could we say accept and test are more black boxish on the API? Yeah, it's black boxy on the API because I don't want to know the inner workings because I just want to know the behavior of my API. Then I would say definitely yes, but I would also um, I would also argue that on a developer test. So it's not necessarily just on the acceptance test. This is a different concern, I would say. So yes, and on general, it's I think it's a general good 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 idea to have the tests uh, thinking uh, this is a black box and we're just testing the behavior. Yeah. All right. 
So how do, how do we do this acceptance testing? Um, here are a couple of examples. Um, these are examples copied from the internet or from, I don't know where, actually, I don't remember. We humans are great communication examples. So that's the reason why all these acceptance testing approaches, they have examples. And examples are great. I, I guess you, you know that as well, because if I give an example to a person, he immediately or she can immediately relate to it. Okay, say, no, this is not how it works. Or, yes, this example exactly how it works but what if if i have this number that is bigger than <laughs> or what if we approach that limit or stuff like that so that's uh, a, a very great uh, way to communicate with humans not necessarily with machines that's a different topic but with humans it's a great communication vehicle peter yes please do you have experience with with problems that when you use examples and you read the specs a year later, so you, you see the examples, but you can't abstract the concept. So normally you, have, you don't, um, you have, uh, let's say some classes of input value that behaves differently. So for numbers smaller than zero, it results in A, for numbers bigger than zero, it's B. And if you just have examples, sometimes it's, for me, it's difficult to abstract from the examples, which are very concrete, to the the actual uh, business meaning. So smaller than zero, bigger than zero. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience on that? I don't have an example, but I think what I would love to see is every example in the test name or somewhere, I would love to read why. So not just zero, then I see get an A, um, bigger than 100, then I get an exception, things like that. I would love to understand what, what's the concept or the bigger meaning behind that. Yeah. And one way would be a test name or test class or hierarchy of things. Yeah, we do uh, more or less the same, yeah. Uh, you have it in the test name, yeah. Yeah, the or concept. In the, you know my, how we write our specs, you have seen them, so it's in the comments because we don't have yeah. steps as in uh, Gherkin. Yeah. I think this is a good point, basically uh, reflecting the general behavior in abstract form in the test name versus having the specific example in the actual test. And furthermore, since we want to test that general statement with maybe multiple data sets, for example, bigger than zero, we might want to test it with one and five, and then we can have like a data table. So this means uh, above the, the test. So the test name indicates the general behavior and then the data table is the mm. specifics. Mm -hmm. Just to mention an alternative, which we don't use, is a property-based testing, mm. where you could say for numbers bigger than zero, you have a random number generator who tries to break your test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have the property and the property scribes. Uh, it's for numbers bigger than zero. But I find it difficult in business applications to find these properties. Mm -hmm. Normally, just use examples to prove something. I mean, on the other hand, this is also a great place for documentation, where you introduce a concept, a bigger picture thing. And on the other hand, I'm not a big fan of documentation for various reasons. On the other hand, maybe if you still see the problem, if you still see the problem, which is a great quote by I have stolen from somewhere, your abstraction is not high enough. Your abstraction is not high enough. I'm not sure who has said that, but I found it quite to the point, especially from a coding perspective because we deal with abstractions all the time. So what I'm trying to say is, um, we, I remember we have written a software for a garn quality checking machine. And this garn quality checking machine um, has a very limited way on how we, we tested that at the time. And I always thought it would be nice to have one test to see, start at the machine, let it run for one hour, assert that it doesn't fall over, basically a fitness function for one hour. And we didn't have that at that time. And if we would have such a thing, we could slowly drill down into, okay, the machine does this, 
from a high level perspective. But what does the machine if it is exposed to plastic? What does the machine if it is exposed to yarn not available? What is the machine doing in certain conditions? And then slowly we drill into the certain features of the machine. And I don't have this example handy because we have not done it, but it would be very nice to, a, a way to, to discover how the system works. Does any one of you have such an example where you can discover how the system works? You entry with one test and then you go to the next test and then you go to another feature file or feature test and then you learn, ah, in this situation, the system behaves this way. Because I don't. And I'm not saying it's easy actually to build such a thing. But it no, would be we nice. don't have such a thing, but our code base is structured in a a feature per feature. So you, <laughs> when you go into the code base, you see, okay, the, you see the subsystems, then you see the features in the subsystem, and then you find the tests <laughs> for a, a single feature. But it's uh, not. I see the big picture and can go into the smaller stuff. It's, uh... But still, you have it. That's, yeah, cool. All right. I think this is why, no, this is not yet we saw why you're here for, but maybe that's also interesting. This now comes the nerdy part. Um, basically, I collected. that. Um, I've, I was very curious about what's the difference between ATDD and BDD. And since we have a lot of exper experienced practitioners here, I want to hear also your input here. So what I think the, the, the commonalities are is that they are both outside in. We always start with the business problem or the challenge or what we try to achieve. We talk with the business people, subject matter experts. Talking means collaborating. We have examples. We have specifications, which is the same thing. And... What I also find interesting is both give you clarity where to start because you have one failing test and then you start there or maybe you have a, hard, a lot of failing tests. But this is, um, I think, where the similarities are. Let's go it a little bit deeper. <clears throat> so um, I think BDD, let me just remove this frame because it's not needed anymore. As far as I understood from introducing BDD article from Dan North, he was not happy with test word. So he started with different ways to experiment there with calling them behaviors or expectations. And he started to remove the test keyword in his tests and um, name it differently. And then slowly he got into this notion of um, thinking about tests from a business point of view. And this was interesting to me to learn. And what I also found interesting is we are matching features and not codes, methods, classes, or whatnot, because this is to me a, a huge smell if we are trying to do that. So if you have methods and we have um, tests per method or classes, I guess this, uh, yeah. What goal does this behavior lead to? It's a common question that you hear there. ATDD, in my experience, is a little bit different in the sense that it's quite related to the user story. So let me just write that down. User story as a I want so that, which is a practice that a lot of teams are doing. Not saying that's the best thing in the world, but it's one way to practice that. I just posted the link in Mio board again because I see people and not so many people there. Um, so the idea there is if you have a user story, you, you, um, the acceptance criteria part, so this is the backside of the card of your user story, is the acceptance criteria. And basically, most of the times people are writing that in the given when then syntax and the given when then syntax is very, it's actually the same as the AAA syntax, as you might be aware, given when then as arrange, act, assert. And once you have figured that out, you will figure out that, hey, we could actually automate our acceptance criteria very easily. And that's the whole notion around acceptance testing. So basically, you discover acceptance criteria, you automate that, and then you start to, to write code to make that green. 
Now, I found it interesting because then you can ask the question, how many acceptance criteria have we done and automated? And that it's kind of an, a progress indicator. So you could start your sprint with um, two user stories and you have um, 20 acceptance criteria there. Then you have 20 failing red tests. And the goal of a sprint is just to get them to green. So there are two pictures on how to visualize that from uh, the Scrum perspective, user story, acceptance criteria for each acceptance criteria, create accepting, failing acceptance test, and then go into the inner TDD loop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this comes from the Growing Object Oriented Software um, book. I'm not sure which page, but it's in there. Write the failing acceptance test and then slowly go into the TDD mode where you actually make the little test green and then you finally hopefully make the big picture test also green. Um, can I add something? Yes, please. You just have to tell me if I have to shut up. No, please. <laughs> because otherwise I feel a bit lonely even if I see the faces um, <laughs> somewhere there. <laughs> um, we, for us, we changed it a little bit because mm. we write the failing acceptance test or spec or BD test, whatever, and we make it green. We don't write the failing acceptance test and then look, how, who else could you write a failing unit test? Because we, we try to write a really small acceptance test. So it goes uh, through the whole backend in our system, it's not the whole system, it's just the backend, for example. And you write a really small acceptance test and we make it green. And when we write the code and we stumble upon some code and say, yeah, but there could be many ways how this could be handled. Mm -hmm. We just write the code to make the acceptance test green, but mental note or physical note that here, here there is something that it doesn't just have one way to go through it. So we should extract that from the code into a module or class or a couple of functions, whatever, and then write tests around this thing. It's a little bit like growing object-oriented software guided by tests. They typically use mocks in this situation. Mm -hmm. We don't like mocks. Mm -hmm. So we just write the simplest possible code to get the acceptance test screen like fake it till you make it mm -hmm. down from TDD. And we know, yeah, but there are more ways, uh, more possibilities, so we extract that. So, and that works really great for us. Because when we, we did it like this for a couple of years and we had a lot of code duplication between acceptance tests and unit tests, mm -hmm. the code is rather simple. Mm -hmm. We always struggle with, yeah, should that test be on the unit test level, the TDD level, or should it be on the acceptance test level? And, and yeah, the value is very limited. Mm -hmm. Olaf wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah. I just, this uh, Earth, Earth uh, explanation here reminded me of a video from Greg Young that I watched the other week where he said, optimize for deletability. And the, 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 the like hypothesis is that if, you, if every part of your system is recreatable, rewritable within a week, uh, you will like optimizing it for, if you lose one of the components, you can just rewrite it in a week. Uh, and he's basically said that with, when you have this mindset, uh, you structure your system in so small pieces that the acceptance tests basically become unit tests. You have shrunk each service or each piece to, to such a small size that there is no difference between acceptance tests and unit tests. I just was just reminded of that when you explained this. Mm -hmm. I think it goes to the same statement that you mentioned me mentioned before, where you don't like the distinction between developers tests and acceptance tests. I think. Yeah. I, I would like to continue with the discussion with others here, but maybe later then. Yes, we can definitely yeah, later if it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Jonathan, go ahead. Yes, uh, I have a question. Um, what do you think would be the consequence if we focus primarily or rely primarily on acceptance tests? Uh, and do you think it's necessary to try to achieve uh, a high code coverage uh, on the unit tests? 
uh, rely only on acceptance tests is was one question but yeah but question... primarily not not uh, not an only but uh, primarily acceptance tests and maybe having fewer unit tests i like that and maybe i can answer that question because mm. we, we... Because with our outside aid, we write the acceptance test. And if it's just straight ahead, simple code, then there are no variations. There will be no unit tests or developer tests or small tests. And But whenever there is an if or a, a dictionary lookup, you have variation. You can go left or you can go right. So then we typically write uh, a smaller unit test around this condition so we ended up with a design that either is i'm an algorithm which uses unit tests around it to make sure that it works correctly because there are ifs in there there are more complex calculations in there and we have i call them orchestrator orchestrators which just say okay first you do that then you do that then you do this and there's just one way to go through this code Control flow has only one path. Mm, yes. Then the acceptance yeah. test alone is good enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's where that's what I kind of I've been thinking about. I haven't had the opportunity to try it, but I've been trying to convince <laughs> uh, my colleagues that that may, may be uh, viable. So I'm happy to hear that. Uh, yeah. uh, that, that could be Do you have a lot of orchestrators so you don't need a lot of unit tests? Or do you have a lot of algorithmic stuff? Then you still need a lot of unit yeah. tests. Mm -hmm. you have a clear reason why you write which kind of test mm -hmm. and can you raise the abstraction levels in your developer tests so that they are interesting for the subject matter experts the other stakeholders that's exactly what i meant uh, mm. earlier is that yeah but the, the stakeholders should be interested in how algorithms work as well not directly the api of the algorithm but the consequence whether we take A or B in an algorithm. Mm. Jonathan, you happy? You want to say yes, something? Yes, I'm, oh, cool. I'm happy. Oh, yes. Thank cool. you for that. Thank you. Great question. And Valentina has also her hand up. Uh, yes, uh, I think this That's is fine. a really, really good discussion. Uh, I would like to add to this. Um, in the case, let, let's say we're building a monolith, the only distinction I see between, okay, a typical, okay, acceptance test, the way most people define it versus a, a unit test is, okay, acceptance test from a black box perspective would, let's say, you know, call the whole application through the UI, uh, et cetera, but it, that kind of black box accept, acceptance test only covers uh, uh, the primary scenario and that is okay the highest business value add scenario and pretty much nothing aside from that but then when we go into the back end uh, i organize the the back end i mean i use clean architecture so i have uh, use cases so the use cases are already you know basically uh, the highest form of expressing requirements. And I currently write the unit, te the unit tests just against the use cases. So the use case could be, you know, create or the use case, cancel or the use case. And everything in that use case should, ha has to be uh, understandable uh, from, from a business perspective. Okay, sure, it's within the X unit language. So maybe they can't read it due to that, but if that same thing was rewritten in Gherkin, which I don't do, I mean, I use just XUnit, mm -hmm. it would make sense from, from a, a business uh, perspective. So then the only diff, and that's the, that's the one where I cover all possible, I mean, all the various uh, uh, scenarios. So that's where I actually get the high coverage of the acceptance uh, criteria. So the only difference between those two is the one that's fully black box. It covers just primary scenario and it uses like real database and real, I don't know, external components or whatever. Whereas this one is the same, but just excluding the real database and having at unit level much more higher uh, coverage. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's all I wanted to say. Cool. I like that approach. 
And it's interesting to find the balance between are we exercising the whole system, which is usually fragile and the user interface and browser automation issues or potential issues. And how much of those do we have? Hmm. Cool. Thank you. Now, good tests, good example. <clears throat> now, this is uh, um, something I, quite, I found quite interesting. What I, did I do this summer essay from an eight year old? So the eight year old is writing an essay and it says, I went swimming, I ate a pink ice cream, my grandma died. I played with my cat on the balcony for two hours. What's wrong or what's good? What do you like? You can use the microphone, you can raise a hand, you can use the chat. You can send me an email, which I'm going to read later. <laughs> Feel free. This is again the audience participation part. So if you watch the recording now, you can speed up a couple of minutes because this is the boring interaction that we're going to have. Or we don't have any interaction, maybe. Otherwise, I point out someone and Andreas like has opened his microphone. I like the swimming. <laughs> yeah. So swimming comes before eating a pink ice cream. <laughs> Question. I don't know. Is that important that we go you, swimming first? You shouldn't eat before you go swimming. Ah, true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so this essay has a couple of challenges, I would say. It's abstraction levels, is order, is the detail of two hours important? And this is a good example um, that I use as well to talk about tests when I talk to non-developers about what develop good tests should look like. All right, now I have again an audience participation part. Um, here we have seven different test examples and I want you to, to rate them and to mark what you like or what you don't like. And it would be great if you could use the, the following symbols or if you could use, or better actually, if you can also make a note with um, your favorite tool, I mean, with a post-it. So I'm going to push you in put breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. And you can decide in which breakout room you want, sorry, in on which test you want to collaborate. Assign automatically, yes. So feel free that even if you are in room one, you decide, hey, I want to talk about the test number six because it's your favorite test that you have looked over in the last second. And I would love that we see each other in seven minutes back and we talk about the outcomes there. So this is also the time where you can fade out because you don't want to do any breakout room because you're fed up. Otherwise, I will open up the rooms. Questions? What are we going to do in the next seven minutes? No question. Rate the test, what you like and what you don't like. And I will come and join IU as well, I guess, yeah. Open our rooms. I won't join the breaking room. I did this once before. And you were lonely there, <laughs> I remember. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. Could be, yes. So, oh, should we have a look? Perfect test you are looking at now. <laughs> <laughs> Only green ticks. Can I have a look and, and think through it and 
Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. That's always always highly context dependent. So yeah. Yeah. Let me grab a couple of ticks. Uh, what do I see here? I see a test that is called the activator tag. So yeah, that's the challenge. I don't know what the, the tag is. Do you still think it makes sense to uh, understand what's going on? Let's try. Tag could be a tag. No, no, it's a tag. It's uh, a tag. You tag something. Okay. So what I would love to see is the three steps. Where is my setup code? Yeah, we uh, don't write specs with the three steps. So we always write host scenarios and host scenarios are typically arrange, act, verify something, uh, uh, act again, verify again, mm -hmm. just our style. So. so there are two acts here, I guess. Authorize, yeah, so authorize is a necessary setup. Yeah, it's actually more of a setup step. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to actually. It's hard to say whether it's uh, setting. Yeah, it's setting up. For this test, it's setting up. I would argue. Yeah, it's setting up, yeah. So this is all setting up stuff, and then deactivation is probably something you want to test. Activate uh, metadata. It's the to... act. Mm -hmm. uh, the execute operation is the actual act. So the thing you do. And then this that's the assert, the rest. There are mm -hmm. a couple of assertions here with the DSL check operation that checks a lot of things. Where is the execute operation? I don't see that. Um, yeah. There where your cursor is. Ah, sorry. Yep. Ah, uh, this bit here. Yes. Ah, okay. That's through our test DSL. Mm -hmm. My there is also the first color. assertions on the same line at the end. Assert success. Yeah. What happens if it's not successful? Uh, it throws an exception. So the test fails. And if you leave that out? It won't compile because the execute operation returns a result. Ah, so F-sharp. to handle the result in F-sharp. Yeah. So the assert success is, yeah, it succeeded and uh, mm -hmm. you don't have to handle it. Mm -hmm. Does the, this test help me to understand what a tag is? No, you, you have to know what a tag is from the domain. Yeah. Can I create a tag on everything? No, I don't see that here. So yes, you, you, you assume you have the domain knowledge, but that's yeah. not a problem in our team. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's in. Let me just see the breakout rooms. Are ah, all of this by himself? Okay. It, we have again the same challenge with all of being by himself. And Pulkit is also by him or herself. All oh, the other rooms are working, I think. Maybe I can ask all of to join the main session. Let's see. Yes, here it is. Hi, Olaf. Hey. I just asked you to join the main session because I saw you were just by yourself there. And yep. Christian is not joining because he's probably not sitting behind his computer. And we're talking about the, the example number seven as well. I guess you have looked at that one. So let me ask you questions, Olaf. Do you understand what a tag is? Nope. Um, what do you see if you look at this test? Uh, 
I see, I see some kind of tag, tag creation, uh, some kind of authorization, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then some act part, which is by the comment only. I'm not reading the code actually. So the comment says that it's deactivate, deactivating this tag, and then mm -hmm. supposedly this tag is deactivated. Then there is a list, this do syntax in the end, which does some operation. Uh, I'm not sure where the actual asserts or verifications are happening. Uh, I think there are multiple asserts here this, because it's a the scenario. Checks, the, the checks or? Yeah, okay. I think. Yeah, there's more or less each line is an assertion. Mm. So it checks that's in the operation log, which means the operation was locked, that it happened. We check that we can present the operation to the user. So the check operation presentation. It should be it shouldn't be undoable. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that almost every operation has to check. So we built the DSL around it. Yeah, the, the, I mean, I have no idea what the domain is. It probably, would probably make yeah. more sense if I had any sense of what it is. Uh, yeah, I told people Definitely. that we assume you know the domain. No, we don't want to explain the domain in the test. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's have a look on all the others quickly. Let's see if everyone is back. I think everyone is back. Let's see what room number one is written. Establish given when then, yep, should notation, readable fluent notation, verifying the output. Room number one, do you want to add something? Inputted output values are inline. Oh uh, yeah, I was, okay, I was in room three, but was writing on, on that example as well. Uh, ah, okay. So I just want to say, so here, this notation was interesting established before because it's okay, but matching it to given when, then that's fine. Uh, the thing which I do like there is the usage of the word should and mm -hmm. the fluent expression of the test. But, mm -hmm. and I also like that it's verifying the output of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, whatever, whatever this is. But the thing that was really strange was uh, where's the logic for roles.admin? Like where's the setup that username corresponds to it? roles.admin instead of roles.manager. To me, this is pointing to some code mm -hmm. issue that there's some hard coding going on. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. I found the subject interesting up here. So there is somehow we cluster tests together in a subject area, I guess. It could be, yes. could be handy exactly. for documentation. I was once a maintainer of the machine specification, so it's a way to group tests um, tests together, yeah. Instead of by classes or namespaces, packages, or things like that. Okay. I have a question. Does that mean, is it sort, sort of like that's the feature that maybe we could have authentication ordering payment, whereas the class, it's more like a scenario in a way? Uh, you can use it like this, yeah. But the, the framework is dead for a long time, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the info. Uh, but you could have a base class with setup code, isn't it? No, Most... never use base classes. No, no not, not base class, that's the wrong word, but um, um, uh, not, not base class, but a surrounding class. You know what I mean? Here. Is that possible? You mean hierarchical tests? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure whether it had something to do with the report that it could generate. I can't remember. Okay. Well, I found it interesting to and how uh, an interesting way to see how you can structure the tests could be interesting to to get inspiration for your your thing. Um, let's, oh yeah, this one, <laughs> there, this is very smelly, yeah, but on the other hand, yeah, everything is there, I like the fluent syntax, comment in the line explaining the last row, <laughs> yeah, in German, have you spotted that, yeah, this whole test smells, yeah, 
approvals yes good point approval testing approach is the tip that you, <laughs> that you can see here actually that reminds me of one distinction we do between unit tests small tests and mm -hmm. acceptance tests and that is we write small tests with only one assertion and our acceptance tests are allowed to have multiple assertions. They are even allowed to have multiple acts. Ah. To check a whole use scenario. Case for the system. So maybe that's yep. a distinction we could make in our code base. Yeah, I like that. So Urs was just talking about this example here. So um, we have here a scenario on how you de deactivate a tag. I don't know what a tag is, but it doesn't really matter for that purpose here. Here we have a lot of setup code. Authorization is needed as well for the test to be running. Then we have the act where we deactivate a tag with this execute operation. And here we have assert success because this is F sharp. So you need to handle all operate, um, cases. And at the end, you have a couple of assertions here. And is this a multi-step scenario, Urs, or is this just one act? No, this is just one act, just so the activation of the tag. Okay. A lot of specs where we, for example, deactivate the tag, and our system allows to accept or deny operations. So if someone has to say, yes, we really should deactivate the tag, we could define a workflow that some HR person has to uh, say, yes, that's a good thing. And then we could add another act, say, okay, it's deactivated. So it's in a pending state. And then we could say, this is really okay. And then it's in a finalized state. Then mm. you would have multiple acts yep. and it's still one scenario. And you like it better to have one scenario in one spec than to split them up and have almost the same setup. Yeah. For us, it's easier. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like and that. It's not a range act assert anymore, but mm -hmm. we don't have problems with that. So for us, it's easier most of the most of the times, not always, to have just one spec for a whole use case. Cool. Let's look at the last example. Um, this is actually an example that I've written a long time ago with a team in Australia, written in the domain language and one tick. I think it's a great test. It's still not perfect, but it's quite a good example for an acceptance test, especially because it's written in the domain language exactly. We're going to have a look on this one in a second. So here is a little acceptance test checklist from Dave Farley. You can find that on the internet. Um, the only thing I want to mention here is two pieces um, that I found interesting. So we call that uh, the Paolo tests. Our tests should be understandable by Paolo. Paolo is a, a business person. He has no clue about technology, about infrastructure, about Java, about runtimes and all those nice things. But if he understands what the test does, then he passes, the test passes the Paolo test. I hope I did not confuse you too much with that saying, but um, this is basically one criteria that is quite important for us. And um, Dave calls this, they are written from the perspective of an external user and we call that Paolo. And the other one is focus on what the system does, not how. This is a black post approach. Yeah. Three steps are visible, precondition action. Yeah. Pretty standard. Uh, so, you you added to... a, so you added the hard bottleneck, the Paolo bottleneck. So he has, he has to review all the code before he can put it online. Not yet, but maybe we should. Yeah, maybe, maybe we, we shouldn't. <laughs> Maybe it's not a good idea, basically, you're saying. But I think it's a great way to get feedback. Like, hey, Paolo, do you see what, what we're doing here? And he would say, no, I have no clue. I yeah, know I mean, we started the same way with our, uh, we don't have, we don't do Scrum, so we don't have a product owner, with, but with our most businessy person in the team. Mm -hmm. And we got away from it because he was a bottleneck. Mm. And ah. we gathered a lot of domain knowledge in our developers. So a lot of things 
if we understand it, it's good enough. Yeah. So, but it, that takes a lot of experience and exercise and talking in the team. What is a good test? So, but it matches for the team. I would also not recommend it all to do this all the time, but I think it's a great way to, in your next next technical code review, invite a business stakeholder and let's see if he understands something or not. Not all the time, yeah. Cool. All right, let's move on. Um, here is here is what acceptance testing makes possible, and this is a list I collected. I, I'm quite excited about. So here we have this test again uh, that we have seen as, as well above as test number five, I think it was. And basically here we're exercising an auctioning system. We're setting up the system. We're changing the state of the system. Then we have a user doing something. And then we switch the system to be running. And after it was running for a millisecond or something, then we would expect the system to be in a certain state. And what I found very interesting and very um, cool is that this allows you to ask what if questions. Now, what if question could be, hey, Peter, but what happens if Anna enters a limit bid of 199? What happens? You could write a test that does that and see how the system behaves. This is a very powerful technique. The second point I want to mention is it's very uh, easy to get a common understanding on how the system works. You have a common language. So what we did there as well is basically we removed all the C-sharp noise and we, we created HTML out of this one here, which is very easy because you just remove the curly braces, the <laughs> equals and stuff like that. You could, then you can generate documentation out of this, these tests. And here we have a special tag for that that we created use for documentation. So all the tests that had this tag were actually used in the documentation. So we had around 20 or something, or maybe 30 used for documentation tests, and they were very key and they are very important to be green and working all the time. Yeah, just a nerd question. How did you implement that the translation? The translation was very easy. Um, it was a T4 template. Um, uh, we looked for tests with that tag, and then we removed um, the underscores. We removed the um, commas and stuff like that. Okay, so it was not text replace. Very yep. basic. Yep. Nothing, nothing fancy. A little bit of bold on the test name and. Every two new lines was a break in the page and things like that, but nothing really fancy. Yeah. Um, here is another Gherkin test, um, very beneficial safety net. Yeah. Um, I mean, these tests are very beneficial because they need to be green. Otherwise, our system is not behaving like it should. Uh, I'd like to add that because you use a DSL, you are really decoupled from the implementation. And you can change or refactor the implementation without breaking all the tests. And it's very important because um, a lot of teams struggle with TDD or BDD because uh, I need to make a change and 1000 tests uh, are read now. So I can't deliver features anymore. And typically the reason is that the tests are heavily coupled with the implementation. Good point. Another heart. Good point. Thank you very much. All right. Now we come to the thing where we all hear the, the, um, the discussion with Dave Farley. <clears throat> so the question is where do acceptance tests poke the system? Poking the system means where is the boundary where the, the acceptance test enters the system and, and uh, does the expectation? Now, can you grab a pen and try to highlight where you think an acceptance test should be in this architecture diagram, an example that I've taken from the internet? Where do you think an acceptance test should start and end? Yeah. <clears throat> 
<laughs> Worse, you're cheating. <laughs> Where should an acceptance test start and end? Yeah, somewhere here. Why somewhere here? Yeah, because here is the interesting logic, I guess. Yeah, you're right. Now, here is um, the answer that I like to think or we like to think about um, acceptance tests. So acceptance tests should start and stop where it's easiest and to get the most um, value out of it. So if you have interesting logic in the UI, you might need to write acceptance tests around that user interface. And if not, if your user interface is just a nice colorful display of a REST API, you might not need an acceptance test around that area. This is basically what we're trying to say here. So it really, really depends, but usually probably it's somewhere around the domain. And I guess Valentina will agree on that with her clean code architecture. Uh, yes. Talk. So basically but, most of my tests are here in what you put as the domain. I mean, I have the use cases as the entry points and then the, the main layer. So that's where most of my acceptance tests are. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do have a smaller number of acceptance tests, which could exercise the whole, I mean, backend. So that means from the REST API to, to the database, or even having acceptance tests with including everything, the UI, even though those ones are the most fragile, but that's mm -hmm. why I would have uh, the least number of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. This is a great way to think about it, yeah. So for me, it's all acceptance tests. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether I'm running it from the UI or whether I'm running it for the REST API or whether um, uh, it's exercising the uh, use cases, they are all for me uh, acceptance tests because they all must uh, relate to uh, acceptance criteria, as in I can't make up uh, uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and the only difference is, okay, the ones which run from the UI, I guess they could exercise uh, acceptance criteria in a way that's most visible to the end user and maybe uh, are readable based on the user story because the user story would specify, okay, when, you know, uh, given that I'm on the screen that I can maybe make a new order. So they are closest to the user. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones which are uh, at the domain layer, and that's where most of my acceptance tests are, they are the ones which can, okay, they can't exercise the UI but or the database, but they can exercise a lot of the logic mm -hmm. within the acceptance criteria. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you take that decision based on what the acceptance test is about, I guess. Uh, yeah, okay, let's see, wait, Re regarding decision, anything that has any scenarios, I automatically put it, I mean, at the domain level, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's simple logic. So if, even if the logic has one branch going through the code, I will have a, a, a test at the domain level for that one scenario. If it has multiple branches, sure, I'm gonna do multiple branches. So anything, so that, that's actually where my core uh, behavior acceptance tests are. Mm -hmm. And the ones where it's exercised from UI, I view it more like sense checking or sanity checking. Mm. Uh, okay, let's just make sure that from the mm -hmm. UI that this behavior is connected and visible and let's just test the most primitive uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. Cool. I like that. I'd like to add that I think 
there is mm -hmm. a lot of advice on the internet how to do acceptance testing and typically do it like this mm -hmm. there are different versions and i think it's highly context dependent what a good acceptance test is for your system mm -hmm. so uh, in our system we mainly check the domain uh, box here the business box but we have the opportunity to run the same tests with a database fake mm -hmm. in memory database so to speak or with the real database mm -hmm. because uh, we are in the seventh year of writing our product and we just saw that we had a high number of bugs that were in the data access so running the acceptance test with a real database gives us a uh, a lot of value yep. whereas we have seldom defects in the client so and we anticipated that client technology changes so fast that every mm. three years we probably have to rewrite the client so we don't invest there because if we rewrite the client we probably have to rewrite the, the acceptance test mm -hmm. it would happen but yeah that what was we, what uh that was what we thought some years ago. So that's why we ended up with this uh, turkeys. I don't know the word in English for this color, the light blue uh, brackets Ex here. Exploratory, exploring tests. Uh, oh, I'm on, a, I'm on a different slide than you. So. I think these were also some good points regarding um, swappability uh, using real or, or fake. Uh, I do a similar thing. So, for example, in Springs using profiles or another mm. re related mechanism. So this means the test would be written uh, based on assuming certain behavior for, for, I mean, assuming that there's a repository. And then if I switch the profile, then that switches what, what it's um run against or uh, in dotnet i mean those environments so. yeah for us it's just if there is a connection string to a deep database it takes the database if there is none mm -hmm. it takes cool. the uh, internal uh, the, the in-memory fake uh, but there is a, this is a trade-off because we deploy our in-memory fake to the production system because Ooh. everything has to be in the same system so you can run it either way mm -hmm. and we added some tests to make sure that we don't <laughs> run the in-memory store in production <laughs> so you just have to think about such things if you have all the possibilities mm -hmm. <laughs> cool thank you very much for your input um, let's go to talk about daily day Farley's opinion on acceptance testing so his opinion is acceptance test for me are by definition running against the deployed release candidate so this is his opinion and i have a different opinion or uh, as, as we could figure out so far so for me acceptance testing is really the collaboration I want to collaborate with stakeholders, subject matter people, experts in the company. I want to understand what they want to achieve. And I want to, to, to get this into our in, into written into a test, basically. I want to understand the domain logic. It's all about the collaboration. The where I'm running the test against which part of the system for me is a technical boundary. It, it's, it's, it's an implementation detail. I guess Dave comes from a different background because he comes from the background, if I'm running all the tests against my deployed release candidate and they are green, I push it to production, which is a great practice. I think that's a great idea to do, but that's for me, not the goal. It, it would be handy. It would be very awesome to do that, but the goal is really a collaboration for me. Who has a different viewpoint? I, I guess you see benefits in both approaches and we can always, the best thing would be to use both approaches, I guess. Other opinions? Who is more on the side of Dave? Who is more on the side of me? Who says whatever works for you, you should do? Is collaboration more important? Uh, in my case, I do view it 
uh, essentially uh, users and collaboration as the primary purpose of software. So regardless mm. of whether it's acceptance testing or anything at all, I always actually trace it to the users. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, users and okay, there's a certain business value based on that business value we're deriving the, the, re the requirements. So that's the primary trail that I see now. Regarding Dave Farley, uh, his ones are always running against a um, deployed uh, uh, release candidate. But uh, I mean, as I mentioned for me, how I have those uh, acceptances mm -hmm. both at the domain level, but also for the whole system level. So for me, it's not necessarily uh, for, for something that's deployed because those unit tests are run dur during build when there's no yet deployment. So I view this one as um, secondary. I think he is uh, speaking mainly from the purpose of um, perspective of obviously the CI/CD pipeline. Yeah. Uh, mainly from just the technical perspective, but maybe it's missing a bit on the business side. Mm. Yes, it's it's always the uh, trade-off that you get with Dave Farley's approach. You get a bigger. Um, Confidence. It's more confident because you really run the real system. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more of the side of Peter's opinion, the acceptance testing, the business logic. And one good thing for us is that when I run the system, the acceptance test on my local machine, we simulate things like service buses and caching. And this gives me the opportunity to, to debug through the system. Mm -hmm. Because everything is synchronized, more or less. So no uh, we shortcut, uh, instead of sending a message to the bus and receiving it, we have a shortcut that just calls the handler directly. So I can just debug through the system. And that is a lot of value for us. When you have really strange scenarios, uh, we can get the real database, the production database on my machine. I can run the operation of the real data and it's easy to debug. And for nowadays systems which are distributed in the cloud, for us, it's really great that we can run, we can run all the parts in a single process. Normally it runs in, with different system, services in the cloud, but we can host it uh, in a single process and it gets really, really easy to debug. Mm -hmm. That's really great value for us. And I don't see that with the approach from Dave, but of course, yes, we have a lot of uh, black places in our code that isn't covered with our tests, but still our confidence is high enough. Mm. And our bug rate is low enough that we can mm -hmm. go with this approach. Of course, if we see a lot of bugs coming in a certain area, we have to discuss our testing strategy and adapt to this knowledge and see that the box go away there as well. I think that's in general a good 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 suggestion. Bug driven retrospectives, bug driven development. Yeah. Um, we could I'm... also say uh, mm -hmm. faster feedback. So by being able to run these uh, acceptance tests really fast, it means that the developer is actually getting the fastest uh, possible feedback. I mean, <laughs> one of Ken's uh, criticisms uh, about ATDD in his TDD book was that uh, it's a really slow feedback process. Like if you're waiting for customers and those tests are failing all the time, but then this kind of way now solves it when you make your developer tests to be actually based on uh, acceptance criteria. Yep. So it's like fast acceptance testing feedback. Yeah. Yeah, and in the perfect world, you could use your acceptance tests that you run locally on your local machine with in-memory and fakes and everything and run them against the deployed release candidate in the perfect world. Um, I can run them locally and they, are, they run in the CI pipeline again with a system that is uh, built ad hoc, but which matches the real system. Awesome. much more closely with uh, cool. the same kind of database 
Uh, the funny thing is for our test, we have a much faster database than the production system. Okay. <laughs> test faster and it, they run for two minutes. So paying for the big database on Azure is not that big a price. Yeah, and the just want to... system doesn't need such a big fast database. So. Interesting. It's the same kind of <laughs> database, so we expect it should behave the same. So, mm -hmm. and the with it should be a deployed release candidate is hard in the cloud because you don't have exactly the same services running on the same hardware because you don't control these things. Mm. But say, yeah, I have the same type of database on the same tier. But it's not in the same network region or anything. So you can't have really that high confidence. You just have to trust the cloud provider that things should yeah. work and sometimes they don't work. So what we aim for is we want really good monitoring to mm -hmm. see when something uh, doesn't work as expected. And we optimize that we can fix bugs quickly. So we don't aim for zero bugs. We aim for low bugs, of course, but um, especially some bugs in the client are okay as long as we are, as we still are able to fix them in one or two hours. That's cool. Our system isn't there. That no lives depend on our system, so mm. they're not that important. But of course, a lot of customers call in to our support if the system doesn't run. So we have to fix it quickly, but uh, that's more value overall for us than write bigger tests to get even a bit more confidence. But again, it's all about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Olaf wanted to mention something. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the, the kind of distinction here of, of uh, uh, Dave Harley and, and Peter, um, and that uh, there seems to be a, a balance towards uh, uh, configuration and production, the production environment, deploy testing in, in for acceptance test. And uh, while while uh, the, the side is to have ability to run all the acceptance tests uh, locally. And if you if you take that, uh, I was just having a philosophical moment where where if you take this to a stretch, you could see that that the the um, having the C CI CD pipeline. Uh, it's kind of a symptom that you don't trust the team to actually run the, all the acceptance tests and all the test automation locally. So uh, in a, so, like an ideal team, you wouldn't need a CI CD pipeline because everyone is be able to run everything locally because you have such a good developer experience. It is actually the same. You don't need the, the, the CD pipeline anymore. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, just a philosoph philosophical aspect where I- Interesting, yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, on your CI CD pipeline, you probably have more tests or less fakes and, and overnight tests and things like that. But I found that it quite interesting. Yeah, we, we get rid of your CI CD pipeline. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's related to an experience I had in our development team where developers kind of abused the CI CD system where they didn't run the test locally because it was uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The developer experience wasn't great. So they just pushed it to this slave machine, which was building for everyone. And it was just more convenient, it's kind of abusing this uh, this build build machine. So it's, it's, it's kind of, mm. yeah. So if it was really comfortable to do the developer experience of running it locally, would that was really good. We wouldn't even need that central machine. Mm -hmm. In our case, we run a lot more tests in the CI pipeline than I typically run on the local system. So tests that uh, look, take the real database and recalculate stuff to see if the calculations still result in the same numbers. And that just takes a lot of time. Um, so we just run them that they take 20 to 30 minutes. They run in parallel to all the other steps. So overall the pipeline ends in 30 minutes with all the tests and I don't run them locally. So uh, but they seldom fail, so it's okay to get the feedback after 30 minutes from the CI pipeline um, because it means that somewhere a test is missing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot, uh, and we have some serialization 
test that we serialize JSON always the same way, that we don't break our contracts. And all these kind of tests are only run typically on the CI system because they seldom fail. And yeah, so it's a combination of lo le learning tests locally to get fast feedback. Cool. And having additional uh, tests on the pipeline. Cool, cool. Now <clears throat> it's 7.37. Now I would... I have some more stuff I would really love to share with you, especially because I want to hear your input. We have a lot of experts here in the room. So I would love to go through this experience exchange now as well. Um, let's do another 15 minutes and then close the session. Let's do that. Let's try to do that. All right, experience. Uh, right. How do you deal? So these are a couple of questions I experienced in the past and I collected this, these questions here. How do you deal with acceptance tests that are not implemented green for a long time, aka multiple days? So this is a discussion I had with a couple of people, especially with Urs already. And there are different ways on how to do it to deal with that. Um, you could put them on a special feature branch, the tests. Yeah. Not such a good option, I think. You could use a special failure mode, a certain inconclusive, because that means we are working on this. So the acceptance test is orange for a long time, for a couple of days, let's say. Here comes the one approach I like doing, start with a small acceptance test or fake it till you make it. And the last approach is run the acceptance test in a separate build step. In my experience, I would combine, I would combine these options. But the challenge is some acceptance tests are going to be red or not green yet for a couple of days because a lot of pieces are moving. And depending from the situation, I would use a combination here. Is there another step or approach that you are doing? Valentina, how are you dealing with this? All of uh, you yes, uh, with that's this? a good one. Um, I'm currently using uh, skip or ignore with the comment in progress. So therefore yeah. we actually have justification that it's not failing due to bug, but that it's actually simply that's a, a user story or something uh, in progress and it worked uh, pretty well. So this means it can all work on, you know, um, on the main mm -hmm. trunk, no issues with it. And we can also see, you know, uh, how much work we we have um, remaining as well in terms of all those, I guess, uh, cool. achieving acceptance criteria. Because you see the indoor tests, basically. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. but the, the only ones which are, as I said, under that skip, are the case where uh, the test has um, a broader, uh, I guess, span. I mean, mm -hmm. the test which might be for the UI or for the REST API, but the acceptance tests which are in the domain, and those are the m majority of tests which, which I have, those ones, uh, they will never, I mean, uh, they are done very fast. So mm -hmm. incrementally. Cool. Let we see if someone has something else. Otherwise, I move slowly to the next. Peter, do you like multiple when statements in one scenario? Here is a it depends answer. So if you have multiple given, sorry, when then, obviously you have two big steps maybe or too many behaviors in one test. On the other hand, you have the advantage that Urs described, you have a certain scenario that you run through. So you can have the full journey of a user or full use case, which is quite nice. Um, if you have short scenarios, generally that's better because less, less things to understand, less, less things to read and uh, do. Um, overall thinking scenarios from a end user perspective, but it really depends. So here is a scrum question. I will skip over that scrum question and I let you read that one later when you have time for yourself. 
our scenarios are very complex. Does gherkin cucumber spec flow make sense then? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. For me, cucumber, uh, gherkin um, spec flow, all these tools are another abstraction layer and not necessarily needed, I would argue. So think about if you really need them because there isn't more tooling involved and things like that. But on the other hand, maybe it works for you because the tests are then easier to read. Urs, uh, that's, that's what I to take that because you're, you are using a lot of acceptance tests, you said, instead of unit tests. Are you using any of these like uh, separate tools or are you just using X unit? Yeah, Urs, I, I yes. Oh, since, since you just, was, yeah. um, I have a lot of history with uh, these tools. So um, nowadays we just use, as we are on .NET, so it's X unit, just the plain, simple unit test framework, uh, no real steps because we don't have to produce a, a documentation out of it. We mm. just talk with people. <laughs> and mm. I've seen a lot of teams. Uh, so I'm in the .NET world, so I've seen a lot of spec flow uh, in teams and it's great for having a documentation but these teams often struggled with refactoring mm. spec flow made refactoring really really hard so just changing a, a single character because it's a typo you have to do the, the forward uh, source code generation again and mm. for me it was a change prevention library after a couple of years in the system so it really gets hard to to change things and another problem i have is that um when teams use user stories uh, for as their product backlog items or their progress um user stories describe a change i want that this happens differently and the all the sum of all tests describe how the system behaves and this is not a one-to-one -one match and if you write uh, spec for the cucumber or the scenarios the same way you write user stories uh, you end up with a system that uh, is not well structured from the specification point of view so it we, you always have to have make a, a mapping from the user story in how you want to write the specification because the specification is structured like your code is structures in systems, sub -module, uh, subsystems, modules. Mm -hmm. and user stories are just touch points from the user if they mm -hmm. are well written. <laughs> A user wants to achieve some goal mm -hmm. and maybe he touches multiple subsystems. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and all these tools push you in a way that, yeah, the product owner can write the, the, mm -hmm. the pros, so he will write it like he writes user stories. And mm -hmm. that leads to a lot of difficulties in the long run. That's, mm -hmm. that's my experience. I talked a lot with the, the creator of SpecFlow, and it was interesting because he writes SpecFlow tests quite differently from what I've seen the teams doing. So there's also some communication problem from the idea of the creator to have teams use it as always mm. it adds <laughs> to the problem but yeah i don't Thank like you. these tools yep and i see the same exactly the same i would say a plus one to everything that was said and um, gherkin can be refactory unfriendly and everything that is and refactoring unfriendly is a no-go for me because that's quite keen to make um, good software from uh, um, work for a long time. And then I have two more questions, which I will not go into for time reasons. But the good thing is you will get those questions and my answer if you send an email to this info at Beyond Agility with subject meetup slides. And then you will get the slides, you will get all the material and everything as a nice download that you can read through later. And you can always ping me later on and ask me a question via email or another medium of your choice. 
And here is a discount code for my next upcoming training in May if you want to participate. It's four long mornings. And if you use that discount code, I will get you a nice discount on that training. The URL is as well in the Zoom chat and also the meetup, sorry, the discount code as well. So with that, I will open now up the references as well. I will open up as well the thank you and the Q&A section of this, this session. Let's connect. Here is a nice area where you can click the links and connect with me if you want to. And so I will close now the session and now we can discuss and have a chat about everything you like if you want or if more questions. <clears throat> so the official part is over now. Okay, if you agree, we stop the video here. Yes. Okay. Stop.